This is a CNIB Lake Joe at Home program. CNIB Lake Joe at Home logo, image description, an illustration of a marshmallow roasting in a campfire with a roof in the background. Okay, thank you. First, welcome everybody, and, and I'm so curious to know who you all are, so we're going to get to that pretty soon. But uh, I'm Myra Rodriguez. I live in Toronto. Uh, I only have light perception now. Uh, but I lost my vision when I was about four years old and was, you know, always between four and three percent, four and seven percent vision through until about 12 years ago. And then um, I lost the, everything else, even color vision, which drives me nuts. <laughs> I'm getting pissed. Anyway, uh, with rock, we'll start with rock climbing first because we've got a beautiful day for this. And I love outdoor climbing. Uh, but indoor climbing is also a great alternative when the weather's not nice or it's wet and so on. So the first climb I did is the photo that Sherry has there. And it was a cliff near Collingwood, uh, quite famous to climbers. And um, my friend Tammy Adams and I had been invited to join a group that are the Adaptive uh, Climbing Society of Canada. And so... Uh, their director for Ontario is Kate Stewart, and they work with all kinds of disabilities and climbing. We were the first blind people they had, and I just found the day so exciting. And the group was very, very friendly and cheerful and helpful. So I thought when we came back to Toronto, I said, we've, got to, we've got to share this with our friends and other people who might enjoy climbing because it's a very tactile sport. Um, anyway, so we did that. We came back and we formed CCB Rocks, uh, a chapter of CCB. And uh, we we had sort of one year of, of climbing. And then our second year in March of 2020, uh, we had a great program for the year. We had our first meeting in the beginning of March at a gym out in the East End. Everybody was enthusiastic. And then March 16th or 17th came along and everything's been shut down ever since. So uh, all the gyms were closed, no climbing, and outdoor climbing wasn't considered to be really safe either. It's too hot to climb with a mask on, and your face is very close to the the, the rock face or whatever, so, you know, where other people are climbing. So we haven't done any climbing since then. Mm. But I wanted to tell you a few things about climbing. But first, um, can you un unmute people for a minute, Sherry or Amy? Who, who's in control of the mute? So people can unmute themselves if they want. Okay. If you're on a phone, it's star nine, or sorry, star six, yes. unmute yourself. Okay. Has anybody, or or have all of you done some climbing in your life? Uh, yes. Just, just give us your name and tell me what you've done, okay? This uh, is Karen. I live on the West Coast, and... Um, my first experience with rock climbing was with high school. Um, I came from a family where my mother insisted on glass, wine glasses on the boat. So <laughs> anything like that, I learned outside the home. And uh, it was in Squamish. Uh, and it was, I had so much fun. It was fabulous. And rappelling was my favorite part. Um, <laughs> Of rock climbing yeah I just I, I love going fast and wild so I just love that part um and uh, also um I've done some rock climbing with my children and when they were probably of age maybe four and five uh -huh. um was uh, my children doing some rock climbing um at Whistler on an out outdoor rock climbing wall um so that was a lot of fun yeah we really really enjoyed that so that or maybe there were five yeah five and six perhaps and that was a lot of fun so that uh oh, so you I had got lots of experience great thank you so much and I know that there's a an active division of the uh, Canadian Adaptive Rock Climbing Society out in BC so oh that's great to know thank you for sharing <laughs> okay anybody else has they been climbing well, my, I'm sorry. My name's Marcia Gilchrist, and I've never, I've never done 
rock climbing or propelling, but I guess sometime I'd like to try it. Oh, good. Okay, well, that's always where you've got to start is want to climb. That's good to know. Anybody else? Uh, yes. yes, my name is Chantal. Uh, I did the uh, rock climbing classes at um, uh, Cégep in, in Quebec. It's in between high school and university. Yeah. And uh, after that, I moved in the uh, Ottawa area and uh, I enjoyed the uh, rock climbing. So I was part of a, a climbing uh, association where they went uh, out in the uh, Quebec side or Ottawa side to do uh, rock climbing. And I do have uh, in, uh, inside the climbing. Uh, mm-hmm. place, indoor climbing? Uh, yeah, um. indoor climbing. Uh, it's like a 12 minute walking distance from my home. So it's nice also. Hey, <laughs> I should turn this over to you, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> but that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Anybody else been climbing? I, I climbed in Colorado. Oh, neat. I was, d- hey, was hey. down there for the Special Olympics in 1994. For wow. And while, while we were down there, we, we took a day and went rock climbing on some massive, um, massive rocks and ledges and just, it was, it was just an incredible experience. To, oh, fantastic. Like ledges, ledges of six inches wide and you have to slide along the wall and hold on yeah. to these little hooks and just, oh. just everything. Mr. Howe, anybody that knows Mr. Howe, and he was the one that took us. And if 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 there was a job that we could do, it was Mr. Howe made us do it. Oh, I've so heard such good really, things about him. That's Sorry, what's, what's your name? Who's speaking right now? Oh, I'm, I'm Jeff Ball from Kingston. Yeah, Ontario. hi, Jeff. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Okay, it great. Was, it was a really neat experience. But that, yeah, you, know, you don't forget it, do you? It's, it's just... No, you never forget you. that. <laughs> Anybody else been up a wall or feeling like climbing a wall? I, my my name is Tiffany, and I would I would try to do rock climbing. I I would find it to be interesting. Uh huh. But I like I have some bouncing issues, so. It, it would probably be like difficult, but I would, I would enjoy to learn how to do it. And yeah, almost anybody, everybody can climb. In fact, you know, we all started our lives climbing, climbing out of cribs, climbing uh, out of lay pans, <laughs> <laughs> climbing on <laughs> when we were older, probably climbing on jungle gyms. But it's sort of a natural thing, and I'm sure our ancestors, going way, way back, um, did a lot of climbing. Um, even before we were human, we had to climb out of the sea into the, onto the shore and up over the rocks. So climbing is a very, very natural activity, and it uses almost every muscle in our body without being weight-bearing. So if you want a sport to match, uh, to cross-train, uh, climbing and running are considered, or climbing and power walking or climbing and jogging are considered to be a really great pair of sports to do together. Um thing is with running and so on you you've got um, you know your your knees and your ankles are consider consistently pounding whereas rock climbing uh, nothing is you're just strengthening and reaching and strength strengthening and with every climb you learn something and you get better so you do um, if you if you do it long enough yeah yeah and and if you start don't worry about getting to the top of everest uh, I tell people, look, if you can get four feet off the ground, your first climb, that's success. Right. Success is, isn't reaching the stars the first time out. It, it's just uh, it's just getting out of the comfort zone of like of being plateau and, and breaking it by learning to climb higher and higher each time. That's right. And there are various and, tricks that you learn when you're climbing. Let me just start first. I want to back, go back, back up a little bit to safety. Every sport has a risk attached to it. Um, And things that aren't sports, like crossing the road, also has risks attached to it, especially in Toronto here. So (laughs) to be prepared when you're going to uh, when you're going to do a sport, when you're going to start climbing, think through what you need. If you're doing outdoor climbing and it's summertime, you're going to need something as basic as bottles of water because it's important to be hydrated. 
You're going to need sunscreen. Uh, you're going to need to start with for your first climb. Usually we suggest just runners, running shoes, good running shoes will, will do. And then once you're usually if you join a course or a climbing club or group, they will initially provide you with the other equipment, such as the harness, which is very important. That's your lifeline. And uh, and often they have helmets, too, that they will lend to people. Though you may want to buy your own helmet. And the helmets are very light and very comfortable to wear. Um, so that that's what you need to begin with. Just remember sunscreen, water, the most basic things, because people can have a disastrous day out on the rocks if they don't have those two things at hand. Um, the climbing community, community is very, very friendly, very helpful. People love to help each other, partly because it's not really a competitive sport. You're competing with yourself and your own accomplishments. So that's, that's where you start. Uh, with our group, we have done... We started with outdoor a few outdoor climbs. We try to do outdoor climbing in the good weather, um, which in Toronto can be June, July, August, September. You can't really climb outdoors on rainy days because everything is far too slippery. It's important to climb with people you feel confident with and people who understand your needs. We find that some climbers like a lot of instruction as, as they're climbing, so they they want the coach or whoever is their partner to let them know where the, how far to reach or which direction to reach their hand for the next handhold or where to put their foot. And other people like to explore the rock face or the wall face first. And then if they can't find where to go or what to do with their foot or their hand, um, look over their shoulder or, you know, indicate to the person on the ground Tell me, tell me what's next, please. Because sometimes the balls, the climbs are tricky. They don't always go straight up. They might dart off to the right or to the left. Personally, I like to explore the wall with my hands first. So you always, you're always in contact with the wall, whether it's indoor or out, with three of your limbs. So one hand and two feet, or two hands and one foot, um, always. So you only, you never lift both a hand and a foot off, out of the grips at the same time. Personally, I like to start with my right hand up, straight up, and then slide my, you're close to the rock or the, the wall, and then slide my hand out to the right um, to sort of um, almost number three on, the, on an old alarm clock and find, the, find what's there. If I can't find a grip, then I do the same, put my right hand back into a safe place to hold, put my left hand up, straight up, reach just a little bit to the right and then sweep my hand out to the left and my arm to look for holds. If I can't find anything and I do a little up on my toes if I can, I still can't reach anything, then I like um, I do appreciate somebody saying, <laughs> do this or do that and you'll find a place to grip. And the same with your toes. Now, once you, if you find you really like the sport and you go on to climbing shoes, the advantage of them is that they're narrow and so you can get your toes into crevices or onto small ledges that you can't do with runners. Um, the downfall is they aren't that comfortable. So once you're not climbing, you want to take them off and put on something comfortable on your feet. It's not like you can put them on in the morning after you've had your breakfast and wear them for the day, including climbing, because they're just not comfortable for that. And even very, very experienced climbers will not will only wear their running their climbing shoes when they are actually at their climbing site, and then they put them on. Um, gloves are a great idea, especially if you're outside and the walls or the rocks you're climbing are rough. Personally, I like gloves that are cycling gloves where the fingers are open, so you can still feel the wall or whatever, but you don't get the. I hate getting the palms of my hands roughed up. My hands are my eyes and <laughs> I'm, I'm very protective, uh, protective of them. So uh, cycling gloves work for me, but some people prefer no gloves and others uh, like to have all of their hands covered. I find that harder because I can't feel things with my whole, all my hands covered. When you are thinking of climbing, you want to try to get yourself in good physical shape. Um, with climbing, it's your the sort of your fingertips that you're using with, that are taking a lot of your weight more than your whole hand grip. So with a bicycle, you've got your whole hand over the handlebar. With 
uh, climbing, you're putting a lot of weight on your fingertips. And there are good exercise things you can get there. They buy, you sell them at um, places like Mountain Equipment Co-op or other sportswear. And there are uh, balls, just little round balls of different uh, density. So start with ones that are very easy to squeeze. You squeeze them, you can put your fingers in little loops, spread your fingers out and in. And there are usually, they usually go uh, three three to a set. So you get your easy one to start with, then work with your middle one, and then work with your lower hard hard ball. And that's a great hand exercise because you're going to use your hands a lot. You're going to depend on your hands. Um, other than that, that sort of is where to start. And you always want to, to climb with a an experienced partner or group and with a coach. And you want to make sure before you start climbing that you're well rested, that you're not headachy or feeling ill. Never do something just because you're asked to do it or just because you have to feel you have to do whatever the person ahead of you did. You don't. Uh, and climbing is one of those great things, as somebody just mentioned, that you can do with your whole family. Children all ages can climb. Uh, at our last indoor climb, we had a gentleman show up who was, 77 years old, very quiet spoken, and uh, his daughter came with him and his son-in-law because they were concerned that he wanted to climb, and he's totally blind. Anyway, we got him to the wall. My heavens, he was up there like a monkey. Nobody could believe it, but he just, it just seemed to come natural to him, um, and we have a few people in our club who are extremely good uh, climbers. Uh, some of them have been very good runners and done multi, you know, the the extra long marathons and so on are still running. They tend to be good climbers too. But everybody is a good climber if you get get your foot off the ground. And climbing is now a sport that is an Olympic sport this year for the first year. So it's an Olympic sport and it's a Paralympic sport. So there you go. You've all got something to work towards if you want to do that kind of climbing. Can we open it up to questions? Amy? Yeah, sure. Does anyone have any questions so far? It's star six to unmute yourself if you're on a phone. I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So oh. I know the answer, but I can direct you if I don't. <laughs> so if you're if you're like totally blind. Yeah. How would you like? Would you be feeling for the the grips, or if you have like those uh, foot loops? Oh, uh, when you're climbing on the wall, uh, you feel for the grips. Sometimes uh, on a gym, in a gym, they will have things that have been drilled or nailed into the wall that you can grab a hold of, like pegs hanging, and sometimes. They are indentations in the wall, but you feel you feel for those. Um, the things with the loops I was telling you about, those are that's a, a, a set of exercise equipment that helps strengthen your hands. The other thing that strengthens your hands is playing the piano. You, you know, play a lot of jazz, really bring it out there, and and you'll get nice strong hands. I met a woman from uh, Calgary, in fact. She and her husband are both climber, climbers, and he's blind, and she is. She has amazing hands, and so does he, but he is a jazz pianist. Papa? There we go. <laughs> okay, any other questions? I think Marsha and Butch might have had a question. Do you have a question, Marsha? You're, if, uh, if you're wondering, you're muted, Marsha. Maybe not. I did have a question, though, Myra. Oh. Um, so when you climb this picture that we have up, you're outside, so it's it's a natural rock wall, right? Mm -hmm. Do you have specific oh, yeah. rock walls? Do you have I'm specific sorry? rock? Sorry, do you have specific rock walls that you like to go to? And do you find that you memorize the rock wall really well, or maybe better than most people, you memorize it so it's easier each time? Yeah, you, you try. That particular wall is up near Collingwood. I've forgotten the name of it. It's very famous for climbers love it. And it has a flat wall straight across. And then there's a corner. So you climb 
so it's like if you imagine yourself in the corner of a room and you've got you're climbing up the corner. So you have yeah. your hand and one foot is one side of the corner and your other hand and your other foot is climbing up the other side. Some people really like that kind of climbing. Personally, I don't find it. I don't find it quite as joyful as, a, as something straight up. Really neat thing is as you go up, like I found that particular wall, when you get up above the tree line and the, the air is fresh and it's so beautiful and peaceful. Just one minute. Hey, Google, stop. Any any other questions? Oh, well, I, 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 I didn't know the rock rock climb one day, but I got a gap right now. So what, I can't hear you. I can't understand what you're saying. Which so said, so that's Bush, and he said he, so I think you were rock, rock climbing at CNIB Lake Joe, right, Butch? Oh, so I can't, can't, can't friend that. Camp friend that. Camp friend. Lake Rosso. At camp, what was uh, it? Lake Rosso. Well, camp Rosso. friend uh, is a camp. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? It's Sherry. Sure. Camp Frenda is a camp close to Lake Joe that also has uh, uh, history serving uh, people with sight loss. Oh, neat. Yeah, I've heard of that one. I didn't realize they had climbing opportunities there. That's wonderful. Uh, they, 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 uh, I did that about oh, almost 40 years ago now. Uh, 40 years ago now. I don't know how it's going to be the lake, the sea, everything. 40 years ago. <laughs> a great view. Like, Okay, that's really good. That's good to hear. And I'll have to. Oh, I'm about to write down again. Yeah. Okay, so it's time for a quick drink. Oh, Everybody no. ready for a drink before we hit the beach? <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> stay hydrated, even in curiosity corner. Oh, the champagne we're going to pop. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, I, actually, I have a quick question. Um, this is Karen. Um, I had mentioned that I had uh, started um, rock climbing in high school and I've done some rock balls over the years. My neighbor um, was a former Olympian and stuntman and he loves to climb what we call the chief out here on the west coast and it's considered one of the most difficult um, climbing and he also goes down to Yosemite parking and loves to climb down there mm. one of the things that I had always thought is is that you needed upper arm and upper body strength and strong legs to climb is that a misnomer or is that something that uh you know well, because you mentioned about the hands yeah. well the adaptive the Canadian Adaptive Climbing Society works with people with all kinds of disabilities and um, some have very little use of their legs. Um, I was just talking to Kate uh, a few nights ago because I now have an arthritic problem with my right hand. And I said, whoops, what do I do about this, Kate? <laughs> and she assured me that I could probably find a piece of equipment that they have in their boxes that would help me to grip with the right hand if I, if I find a, I'm having trouble with that. There is a wonderful man I heard interviewed on CBC about a year ago. When they had a strike and the parks, the national parks were not being cleaned up in the States, and he went every day to Joshua Park, which is where he loved to climb, and did a massive cleanup. The interesting thing about this man is that he's in a wheelchair, no use of his legs, and he said every time he finishes the cleanup, he rewards himself by climbing. So he's got amazing upper body strength. And he said when he's climbing, he doesn't feel that he's got a disability at all. So... Uh, there you go. They, they deal with people with, in wheelchairs, people with all kinds of disabilities. And a number of people also who have learning disabilities or cognitive problems um, love climbing. And they learn to climb and they're rewarded because, every, you know, and the uh, Canadian Adaptive Society also works with, with groups. That sometimes we join them, sometimes uh, we don't. But... Yeah, really, it's a matter of each individual just trying and finding out. And I would suggest if somebody has a, a, a physical disability in their arms or legs or their back, 
the first group I climbed with, there was another person. I've had four spinal surgeries, and she'd had the same surgeries with the same doctor. So <laughs> we were <clears throat> that was kind of neat. So people have all kinds of, of of problems to overcome, and some people don't have a physical problem, but they're terrified of heights. And uh, I don't know any blind climbers that are terrified of heights. Now, I don't know if that's just a coincidence or if we just don't, you know, enjoy the immediate what we are touching and we're not worried about what's above or below. So does that help? That's so beautiful to hear. Just wonderful to hear. Thank you so much for sharing. Now, if you if anybody would like contact information for uh, the Canadian Abductive uh, Climbing Society, I have it right here. Um they have a web address, and, and the director here, Kate Stewart, is the person. We, our group always climbs with this society. Um, I mean, I'm president of the club, and we have a treasurer, and we have a secretary, but we rely on the that Canadian Adaptive Climbing Society to ensure everything with safety, with volunteers. Well, we take bring along volunteers, too, but they have trained volunteers and climbers so that well, when, we're, when you're when you need to be, um, we always climb in a pair, and the person handling the ropes, um, this is where you get rappelling down, <laughs> uh, is usually a sighted person. Some of us have learned to um, handle the ropes, but I wouldn't do it alone without a sighted person uh, nearby because the ropes can get tangled up near the top, and you, I wouldn't see that. But sometimes when I'm lowering a friend down, I say, now behave yourself or you're coming down fast. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm careful. <laughs> so so I, I see that Amy took out a, a pen. Is do you, Can you give us that web address and then we can share it? Sure. With... Uh, right now, uh, the web, web address for the website is www. And then altogether, Canadian Adaptive Climbing dot com and the email address for Kate who is our Canadian our um, director here in in um, Ontario uh, okay her email address is Kate K A T E at Canadian adapt, uh, adaptive climbing dot com and I do have a phone number would that be helpful to you Sure. Okay, let's see where we are. This is the office number. So it's 1-519-857-3503. My cat <laughs> commenting here. Great. And so that number is for Kate or is it for the... the uh, that, that's for Kate. She handles all the calls coming in. I mean, it's a small, it's a small organization, so... And she is a diamond. She, hey, Amy. Going. Yeah. Okay, Karen put it in the chat. Thank you, Karen. I was going to do that too. So for those of you who can access the chat, that information is in the chat. And for those of you who can't, you can ask me and I will send it to you. Uh, we'll get it to you somehow. Hey, Amy, can you email me the information? Please? Absolutely. Sorry. No worries. Would anyone else like me to email it to them or to call? It would just be easier so that I can share it with my mom that way because the chat is kind of hard for me. Yeah, if fantastic. Okay. Of course. Thank you. So, Myra, sorry I'm to going... take up your time, Myra. I'm sorry? Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. To take up your <laughs> time. Least, we're talking at the same time. My apologies, Alessia. Um, so I know you want to get into talking about dragon boating. I know Tiffany has had her hand up just for a, a couple minutes. Tiffany, okay. do you have a last question about climbing? I do. Okay. So, so if you're if you're climbing, would you be like alternating hands with with your legs, like as if you were walking, or would you do your let's say your left hand and your left leg at the same time? Um, usually you, you start by reaching up with your right hand or your left hand, and then, uh, you can only go so far with your hands without having to put your legs up. So, uh, I find the easiest way I try to get one hand up, maybe two, and then I have to, uh, move one foot up and then the other, 
that's the way I like to climb, but it sort of just depends on, on the surface, on the environment as to what you find easiest. Like, is there a, a safer way to like do it so you're not slipping? Well, there, once you get into climbing shoes, some of the shoes are nonstick and you can actually climb the wall the way, uh, the way um, spiders can climb up to the ceiling, just climbing on the wall. So, uh, but you're, you're pretty safe because you've got a harness on. The har- harness is around your legs and around your waist and you're on a rope. So you're very safe. Even if you let go completely, you're not going to help hurt yourself when you're properly tied in and you're climbing with an expert. Okay? Okay. Okay. So let's go to dragon boating. Um, has, has anybody been dragon boating? Did we, we didn't do this, did we, Sherry, Amy? We just focused on climbing. I know that um, Jessica, uh, yes, her partner James is waving, um, is an avid Mm -hmm. dragon boater, but uh, she couldn't be on this call, unfortunately. So um, are are you, James, also a dragon boat? Yeah, actually, uh, Jess and I are uh, managers of our local transplant dragon boat team out of Waterloo. Oh, neat. That's wonderful. Okay, so anybody else uh, involved in dragon boating? No, I've actually never heard of it. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, start, we'll start at the beginning. So a drag, dragon boating goes back about, I don't know, 2,500 years at least, and was started in China. Um, then uh, at the time of the Cultural Revolution, um, it came to an end there, but was picked up in other parts of the world. And Canada actually became very active in dragon boating and and held world records for quite a number of years. A dragon boat is like a large canoe. Um, It seats up to 20 paddlers on each bench. There are 10 benches, and each bench will take two paddlers. And at the front of the dragon boat is a little wee stool where at times of competitions or festivals, you have a drummer there. And then at the back, there's quite a, quite a large space there where you have your steers person. Quite often the steers person and the coach are one and the same person. Um, at times of competition, the dragon boats are fitted with dragon heads and dragon tails. And they're in different colors and they're a lot of fun. And at the last uh, competition that our crew did, uh, we're Team Dragonfly, by the way, um, our coach afterwards uh, went and got uh, the dragon heads and dragon tails and, and let people hold them and touch them and, and see what they were like. So we got a full picture of of, of the boats usually have, um, they're not all done the same, it's usually a whole variety of the way they're painted. The boats are very sturdy. Um, and at the time of competition, that's when you have a drummer at the front. And the drummer also, as well as drumming in time, hopefully to the beat, the stroke, that the coach wants uh, is also is a bit of safety because she can see behind the steers person and alert that person as to if a boat is coming very close to us, if you know, any other danger or so on. People are placed in the boat depending on, depending on their weight for the most part. So you have your heavier people, your bigger people, um, usually in the middle of the boat. That's the drag. That's the engine room. And uh, you can have um, three, you know, probably six people in that area. That's where we put our strongest paddlers, the big guys that can really move that boat. The front of the boat, you have smaller people who uh, are very good at uh, paying attention to what the coach works wants because they're very good in helping her to maneuver or him maneuver the boat. It has to go a little bit left, a little bit right or whatever. And then at the back of your boat, you have your rockets, which tend to be smaller people who can paddle fast, very fast. Because by the time the boat, the water's coming to the back of the boat, it's going really fast. So you, your stroke is faster than you are if you're in the middle of the boat or the front of the boat. It's very important in the dragon boat once you're in, but we're going to go back before we get in, but I'll just tell you this first. Once you're in um, and seated to pay full attention to the coach, to listen to coaches' instructions, even if they're not directed to you. 
So we listen to, uh, if a coach is talking to somebody up near the front, we all want to hear what's being said, because usually we can all learn from the same thing. Um, and then also, it's important not to be talking while, the, while you're out in the water, because the coach needs to give instructions. Sometimes it means paddlers on the left, you know, back paddle or to maneuver the boat back and forth, depending on what's being done. Um, it's also important never to move in the boat. So don't decide that you'd like to go to another seat. Uh, stand up. We've seen boats go over by people standing up. One happened uh, in Toronto in, uh, in uh, what year we are, in, in the, end, the summer of uh, 2019, actually. And it was cold weather still. It was April, and they were kind of a new team, and somebody decided she'd rather sit two, seats for, two seats forward and on the other side. And by that move, the whole boat went over and everybody was in the water. Luckily, they were all wearing life jackets and nobody was injured. But it really, um, we learned a lot from that. Um, and I won't go into that now because you don't need to do that right away. So being quiet, paying attention to the coach, the steers person. And even when you're coming into dock after a, after a paddle or practice or after a race, no matter what, you want to keep your hands on your paddle, and you want to keep your make sure you don't sort of jump up and cheer. Um, I was <laughs> um, down in Montreal some years ago, and there was a new um, a new team there. Actually, they were blind, visually impaired people. Uh, they were extremely good. They were very, very good, and they beat us. Coming in, they were so excited that when they reached the dock, they threw up their hands and cheered, and the boat went over. So they got initiated. <laughs> it was quite a dunking. Everybody was safe. Everybody was okay. The thing with dragon boating, uh, we wear life jackets. And I suggest if you want to, to get involved in dragon boating, it's a very good idea to get your own life jacket. Um, usually, um, teams and crews and organizations, they have life jackets but they can be really wet and bucky. And if you're at an event and they're all stacked on the on the ground somewhere and then you're ready for your next race or your next event, you'd rather put on something that fits you and that you can keep relatively dry and tidy and so on. So uh, when I get a team ready to board our boat, I like everybody to, before they go to the dock, to have their life jackets on and done up. And... Uh, now, coaches and captains have different ways of wanting to board the boat. Some like everybody lined up on, on shore and uh, in the order in which they're seated. So you'd be assigned to, you know, bench one, two, three, four, up to ten. Eh? Um, other coaches just like to maybe have the people at the front and the people at the back and the people in the middle. It's all, all, every coach is different as to how they like to board the boat. But the important thing is to board very safely. With uh, the uh, blind, partially sighted teams that we've had, that I've had, um, at the beginning of the year, uh, to to qualify as a visually impaired blind team, you have to have 50% of your people have to be blind or visually impaired. It is very helpful to have sighted people. Uh, also, it's, they make great teammates, and they're very, very helpful in helping to board. Um, but Having sight doesn't make you a better paddler. In fact, the last two years, we've had wonderful people paddling with us who had full vision but just couldn't get the idea of, of paddling in sync with everybody else. And you have to paddle in sync. Uh, so that's one thing I want you to keep in mind. With uh, having specialized teams, with our teams, uh, well, now we have just one right now going, uh, we say, look, it's a team where people, People can learn the basics, can lear learn the strokes. Uh, we, in uh, 2020, we only got involved in one uh, festival, which was at the end of the year in September. Everybody enjoyed it. The more festivals you have built into a Dragon Boat program, the higher the cost. And we wanted to keep the cost pretty reasonable. And we had some people who were frightened of racing and others who were dying to race, so we figured, okay, one race, that's it, and then those that don't want to, everybody did want to come, though, which was great. Um, the other thing you can do with Dragon Boating, there's a wonderful uh, boot camp down in Florida, 
every spring. Now, I don't know if it was on this year. Others might know. But I, I went to that boot camp twice, and twice we had a blind, partially sighted team. Uh, we worked really hard. We learned a lot. It's a great place if you really want to hone your skills. It's down in Florida near Orlando. And the second time we went down, in fact, at the end of the week, there was a competition. And out of eight or nine teams, we came in second. And the only team that beat us was the U.S. national team. So <laughs> we expected them to beat us, but not by a lot. And, uh, and we had one deafblind guy on our team. He was amazing. He was very, very strong and uh, lots of fun. And he had a little bit of vision, but he did need a little bit of prompting from whoever was sitting beside him would sort of indicate if, if we were getting instructions. And he picked that up very fast. They had a couple of ways of tapping on the fellow's knee or whatever to let him know what was about to happen if it wasn't obvious. So that's another option for dragon boating. Um, again, safety, safety, safety. So... If you don't swim, it doesn't prevent you from dragon boating. But usually coaches want to know who is a swimmer and who is not a swimmer so they can pay special attention to you. Uh, I was in one boat that went over. I forget. We were racing. I forget why we went over, uh, but we did. And we on that boat, we were most – oh, I know. It was the, the, the ten, 10 paddler boats. They're, they're much tippier. I wouldn't advise them for beginners. Anyway, our boat went over. The chap behind me, I was sitting at the back of the boat, and our uh, coach organizer, he hadn't organized, we had two boats competing, and he hadn't organized for a second steers person. So he commandeered this guy as we were on our way down to the marshalling area. And the poor guy, he didn't have proper shoes on. He wanted to go get his, cha- his shoes. And our coach said, no, no, no time. So anyway, he, he kindly came out as our steers person. But um, he fell off the boat. And when he slipped off, our boat went over. Um, and we, had, uh, we did have non-swimmer. We had a non-swimmer, fully sighted person. We had two non-swimmers. They were both fully sighted. And one of them was very calm. Um, she had a standard life jacket. She felt secure, and she helped other people get to the boat, hold on to things, so on. Her other poor person, who had been our, our drummer, in fact, uh, she had a very fancy life jacket on, life belt thing on. She didn't know how to operate. She didn't know how to inflate it. And we found at that time, she didn't. She would, not only did she didn't know how to swim, she didn't know how to tread water. So that was a that was a, a panicky situation. You want to know who's who's a swimmer, who's and everybody. I like everybody to wear standard life jackets, um, unless you know you're really experienced and and everybody knows that you're very experienced. Um, that's about it. Again, um, we're running low on time. I know. Make sure that you're prepared before you go dragon boating. That you have water, sunscreen, hat if you need it. That you're protected from the sun in the summertime. There's no I have never found a suitable indoor alternative to dragon boating in the wintertime. We, we do have places where they're indoor pools, but some people benefit from them. I, I really don't find that. I like to just go south as soon as the weather gets nice and join something else down there. But dragon boating is one of those things that once you're into it, if, you want to be, if your team wants to be competitive, you can do that. If you want to be um, a leisure team, you can do that. We have one team here in Toronto that's been going for years, They've never, ever entered a festival or a race. And they always have far more people signed up than they can take on their team. And then there are others that say, no, no, I want to, I'm competitive. I want to win a medal. So, it, you know, you can start with one and go on to another. There's lots of options with dragon boating. Uh, I think we're getting close to our time, are we, Amy, Sherry? Yeah, we've got a few more minutes left. Okay. Did you did you want to open it up to some questions? Absolutely. Hey, Myra, uh, can I ask you a question if that's okay? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, where is the best place to get comfortable and get used to dragon boating before a um a race? Oh, yeah. Um, 
if you find a team that does leisure uh, dragon boating for pleasure, that's the best place because there is a way of, like with a dragon boat, if you've done canoeing, yeah, I actually found, I, I taught uh, canoeing at Camp Sound in Vermont when I was young, younger, <laughs> and I found it very hard to get onto the dragon boat stroke because you put your paddle in, you reach forward with your paddle, and your two hands on your paddle, you bring your paddle back quickly, and you bring it out fast at your hip and swing it forward. Whereas with with um, canoeing, you know, you have those lovely leisurely strokes and feel go forward. So find, the, I think the best way to start is to find a, a group that will have beginners. Most areas or cities will have various teams and will have them. Um, was, it, was it Jeff who's down in? Who's the gentleman who, who ha runs a team in Kitchener? James. James? Yeah, and James yes. has his hand up right now, actually. Oh, good. Yeah. Can you help, James? Yeah, the, the stroke is very different than uh, a canoe stroke. With a canoe mm -hmm. stroke, you're you're making a J. And yeah, it's it's a big reach and very quick kind of a stroke. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very different here in Canada versus the West Coast because they do a lot shorter stroke and it's a lot faster. So it's also yeah, regional. I, I, yeah, and I, I uh, have gone paddling mm -hmm. a few times with a, a team out in Vancouver, and it's very different paddling in the ocean than it is in a lake. Um, also, they had really long practices, like we were out for an hour and a half to two hours. I couldn't believe it. But wonderful fun. But this, the water feels different. Everything feels different when you're in the ocean in salt water. Um, well, I'm, I'm yeah, you are. Yeah. So it looks like two people with their hands up. Oh, sorry, Amy. Oh, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. It looks like Michelle. Uh, Michelle hasn't asked a question yet, I don't think. So, Michelle, did you have a question? Go for it, Michelle. So I actually have a question and a comment. You'd made a comment. I live in Saskatchewan and have blind friends who dragon boat on our mm -hmm. dragon boat team here. And mm -hmm. in the winter time, they uh, before the YMCA closed down downtown because it was fairly central, they would use the pool there and get in dragon boat and play tug of war mm -hmm. with each other. And that's how they would keep up their skills in the winter time when we couldn't paddle out on the lake. Um, yeah. oh, so that, that I, is another option is to go into your local YMCA with your group and say, hey, um, during COVID, they've actually been using their bathtub. So they all get together oh. on Zoom and they all get together with their, <laughs> if they have their own paddle and they all get together on Zoom and just practice the motions of, okay, I'm pretending I'm in my, my boat uh, on mm -hmm. this, or their pool. A couple of my friends have backyard pools, same kind of thing. You know, they just do the motions of, of, the, uh, of, of paddling. Um, without being in an actual an actual boat itself. So my question is, it's no, uh, no, um, everybody knows in that team that I only have one good arm and that happens to be my left arm. And when I explained to my friends, you know, because they were trying to get me to Dragon Boat when they first started, and I said, well, you know, I don't have really good uh, control of my right hand. Uh, even in canoes, when I canoe really fast, my hand often slips off the top of the paddle. Um, mm -hmm. But my question, so their, their idea to fix that would be to tape my hand to the paddle. And I'm like, okay, that's an idea. That's kind of a crazy idea. Mm -hmm. But you're having to use a lot of tape every time. Like they paddled su Sundays and Wednesdays. Um, so that's a lot of tape if you're having to tape your hand. And I have to also get somebody else to tape my hand because I can't do it, right? I can't tape my hand with one hand tightly and, and hold it with the other, right? So um, I've been trying to find either gloves or something or a, like a, a hinge system. Uh, I There's a, a group in or a, a store out of, I think it's the UK that mm -hmm. is called Active Wear and it's for people who have limited mobility to be able to do weightlifting. And it's basically a glove that you mm -hmm. have, has a great big Velcro loop. And you put the Velcro loop over top of, say, your weightlifting bell so you can push it down without actually having to have the strength in your, in your fingers or your arm to pull it down. Um, but with dragon boating, there's nothing really that has that kind of dragon boat um, posture, that same kind of canoe dragon boat posture. Because um, everything is either pulling up or pulling down for like weightlifting um, or pulling forward. 
uh, those kind of things. It's nothing that's pulling up and down or pulling like sideways when you're when you're going down. So I don't really know what to tell them other than to let them tape up my hand, which I, I'm not a really big fan of. Have you tried paddling on each side of the boat? Uh... Because it might be different. I mean, once uh, if you're paddling on one side, your one hand is high and the other is, is lower. Yeah. And, and if, my, side... if I paddle on the left hand side, it's my stronger side. So the strong, mm-hmm. so my my stronger hand, and I feel more more secure on that side. If I paddle on the on the right hand side, I don't necessarily feel as secure because my weaker hand is at the bottom, uh, mm-hmm. and I, I don't feel it's not that I'm going to tip over. I just don't feel that I can do the strokes fast enough because they're going you know one two three four one two three four one two three really really fast, right? Whereas if I'm paddling with my stronger hand on the bottom. I, I have that confidence to go, okay, I can keep in sync with people more because I have the ability to move my arm uh, easier because it's the, yeah. it's the stronger side. I'm wondering if something could be designed that would go over the top of your paddle that you could put your fingers through without being taped on. Right, kind of like Velcro maybe. Because that was the other yeah. option I was thinking was kind of putting Velcro on like a glove on the on the palm and Velcro on the top of the paddle. Yeah, that might work. Like I'm going to have to do use that when I'm cycling now because I don't have the use of my thumb very much, um, and I don't, you know, if we're pa- if we're driving <laughs> cycling fast, I want to make sure I'm not going to let go of my of my uh, bike on my right side. So, ladies, this is have, Karen. We have one our team who has who does have hand issues and I know that she was looking at um, having a velcro coming down I forget if it was velcro or what she had and she could slip her thumb through and her fingers on top that way also she didn't feel trapped so if she needed to let go of the paddle she could Great. Um, um, unfortunately so it is now 4 p.m. so I think we're gonna have to wrap it up I'm so sorry everyone um, this was fantastic. I will say that we do post these on our YouTube channel, right, Sherry? So it can take us like a week to get the closed captioning and that kind of, you know, all the accessible um, uh, accessibility pieces incorporated, but we will post this um, online so you can view it again. And uh, um, if anybody wants, um, those email addresses. And I see James has also sent a, a website uh, URL for dragonboatcanada.ca. Good. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, so there's lots of resources. Maybe, uh, you know, Myra, you have just, uh, you know, wet the whistle, you've stimulated our appetites. Uh, you well, know, some of us are, sorry, go ahead. I just, I, I just want to mention there is a, a a dragon boat team down in the Maritimes in Dartmouth, but I'm hoping to paddle with them soon. And there are two teams out in Vancouver. There's one up in Edmonton. These are teams that uh, uh, specifically uh, have blind, a mix of blind and sighted and partially sighted people. And we have had uh, on our team paddling here when we've been in competitions, had three of the guys from Edmonton come and join us and, and man the engine room because they're big, strong guys. <laughs> Anyway, it's been wonderful to chat with you guys, and I'm really impressed with all the experience in this among this group. Keep climbing, get in the water, and have fun. Have a good summer. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much, you. Myra. Yeah, I'm surprised how many uh, sort of stellar athletes we have on this. I shouldn't be probably, but it uh, <laughs> means I've got to work a lot harder. Um, Looking forward to learning how to climb on the tower at Lake Joe this summer, hopefully. And maybe we can get a, a Lake Joe dragon boat at some point. Oh, that yeah. would be neat. Yeah. yeah. To learn more about CNIB Lake Joe at home programs, visit cnibblakejoe.ca.